Hello again. Hello again. Good morning. Good afternoon, etc. Or whatever it is. It's <laughs> afternoon where you are, yes. Lunch, lunchtime. Or like lunchtime. Yeah. nice. Well, good morning to you. But before we um kind of continue where we stopped yesterday, since yeah. I also had time for that, I'll show you two slides from that play thing, because I think you will find this interesting. Yes. A bunch of areas that are involved. Um, the biggest takeaway is thinking about the amygdala for fight and flight and the frontal cortex for more um, higher level processes, thinking, for obedience, all these things. Yep. But they're all kind of connected. And what it really does is um, train the brain to mm -hmm. respond in the moment to your play partner. What tactic is that person, that person? What tactic is that partner choosing? How do you respond? And it makes this brain very, very flexible, but also active. Interesting. And the neurotransmitters or the, well, they all tested this with neuropharmacology. So you can knock out opioids, you can knock out dopamine and see how this um, affects play. Yes. So based on that, they know that opioids uh, and ca cannabinoids, they are for the pleasurable experience of social play. Right. So they make that feel good. And then dopamine is, you know, as we expect for the motivation to initiate play, but mm -hmm. they are really two processes. So you can have rats that like play, but they lack dopamine to initiate it. But once they're oh. in it, they're in it. The higher noradrenaline is, mm -hmm. the less likely the, the, the rats will engage in play. So it kind of blocks the, the engagement with play. And you know, you, I think you see this all the time, right? If the environment is too stressful, dogs need a little longer to engage in play or be almost. Or, yeah, um, absolutely. And, and it's because of that. Is noradrenaline more present when they're, if they're fighting? Yes, uh, fight or flight response in general. So noradrenaline, just like adrenaline, um, it blocks kind of like this pleasurable, basically the cooperation part of right. the play is more blocked and it turns into, you know, when you see dogs play and then all of a sudden they become more aggressive. Yes. It kind of turns into that more aggressive thing. Interesting. Yeah. That, that, that's super intriguing, you know, when play shifts, because we all see that happen routinely where do dogs are inviting play, the play starts, it escalates due to arousal and one being pushier. They're not yeah. necessarily cooperating at a certain point and it turns into a fight, right? Yeah. So that same kind of interest and it'd be really interesting to know neurochemically if there's a change that happens in there or if it just happens because one of the dogs isn't isn't paying attention to the other signaling right? yeah yeah i thought about this too i think it's so hard for dogs nowadays <laughs> to really oh. trained in the like be put up for success in terms of actually learning how to read another dog's signals just like just per se the looks of the dogs are also different right. <laughs> like, so hard yeah. for a dog to understand um, but I'm wondering also because these rats, these strains, right, they have genetically, they have genetic defects and those rats that, for example, don't initiate play, they have, um, a defect in their dopamine signaling. So I would assume that it's also some that, that, you know, have to, some other defects, maybe have a harder time actually going into the pleasurable right. and cooperative state and go straight yeah, to the, that's full of implications <laughs> <laughs> and here's another one <laughs> another project we need to do this play before stress blunt the stress this play after stress help with recovery and then it is is play a strong enough motivator to play while under stress right which is a place where it's kind of interesting right that's one of the things that we're constantly dealing with with reactivity is could you reduce reactivity by playing with the dog ahead of going into a stressful environment, right? Or make the stressful environment predict play, or can you use it kind of like in the moment to, like we were talking about yesterday about blunt, the dog putting on blinders to tune out things in the environment through, through play as well. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, she's not, she can't engage in play just anywhere quite yet. Mm -hmm. She's a little stressed. But I started to do just right before, like first for 20 yep. seconds and then I go on a walk and see, trying to, you know, journal how she, how she, if you kind of can take that thing better. Yep. 
and then I would also I would also potentially end those interactions with play, mm -hmm. right? So if you wanted to expo play with the dog uh, 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 before going into a new environment, and then have the new environment obviously predict play, something we do routinely to with working dogs, like new environment predicts play, new environment predicts play, and first portion of those dogs during rearing, that new environment is varying degrees of stressful. And so some of the dogs that won't play in that environment, you take them into that environment, let them be in the environment for a period of time, leave the environment and play with them, right? Like in a sort of pre-max style, mm -hmm. right? um, because they won't necessarily play directly in the environment. Right. Right. But that's part before is interesting. Yeah. So many, so many new things. <laughs> and this is stuff that I find a lot more intriguing than, you know, the, the uh, everlasting conversation about, you know, pure positive versus balanced and you're kind of stuck in that. What we really want to do is not have our dogs feel stress, but it's actually not true. Sometimes they do have to feel stress. Oh, they absolutely have to feel stress. This is, that's a big conversation that yeah. doesn't get had enough, right? Yeah. But obviously stress is a part of life and there's no avoiding it that's one of the big like i hate the conversation as well the fact that we spend too much time trying to argue about force free versus balance versus whatever this kind of nonsense ultimately but we're stuck there right having this conversation but um to me that that that's going to be the most interesting part is um inoculating the dog against future stressful experiences and if there's this idea that we're using stress or st we're stress is incorporated in training as a last resort right there's that's the kind of idea this least intrusive minimally aversive all that sort of thing like okay you've exhausted all your other possibilities and now it's time to to we don't have a choice we have to use an electronic collar or we have to make the dog do something but we've after exhaust but that's never the best way to do that right like small doses of appropriate structured stressful experiences during a dog's rearing makes them more resilient to stress right and that's one of the things that i found happened a lot when we when you got really good at manipulating dogs with rewards you could shelter them a lot from stressful experience and then they didn't respond to stressful experiences well at all right mm -hmm. so uh, how do i calculate an introduction of deliberate stress instead of waiting for the world to throw it at you in a situation where you're potentially not ready to cope with it and you can't control intensity. That's which, which is part of the argument for the way we do leash pressure or things like that, right? Yeah. And there are alternatives to that, but I kind of want the dog to work through little minimal doses of stress along the way, right? Yeah. When even handling drills, whatever those are, like we don't want them to be too purely driven by reward systems right because those tend to break down under stress yeah i think i mean there's just so much evidence that short-term stress acute stress is healthy not just for for dogs or any other for us too as, as humans um it improves your 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 focus it improves your learning it makes your immunity better fight off whatever bacteria whatever you know you basically challenged with so acute stress is really really good and yeah. that's what working out is ultimately too yeah exactly exactly stressing your muscles and stressing <laughs> your cardiovascular system <laughs> yeah yeah and and um with, with the stress yeah there's obviously adrenaline and there's cortisol but there are other hormones and neurotransmitters one of them are glucocorticoids and in some experiments you know you get mice almost addicted to work to get an injection of these stress hormones because they get this rush and it feels good good mm -hmm. so there's no doubt about you know acute stress actually being being um helpful and emerging studies you might find this interesting i haven't looked into the mechanisms but over the last two or three or four years um what they have sh shown with with mice so you can put them um, through chronic stress, so they go into depression, they lose any hunger drive, sexual drive, everything's gone. Um, they're just a blob of rat or mouse. Right. Um, and then what they do is they do nothing but put them through short-term stress every day, a tiny little bit, and they recovered from long-term stress. So Ooh, they started, really 
Yeah. They got back to normal, basically, only because of the short-term stress. I mean... Ooh, that has lots of implications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, after, I'll find a publication. I haven't looked into details. How right. would you do that? If you had to translate that into handling docs, how would you I do think that? I think probably that people that are skilled at their pressure related work um, around obedience connected to reactivity are probably doing some version of that, right? It, it, like meaning small doses of stress to compel a dog into like alternative behaviors um, around reactivity issues. If it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of delicate work and which is one of the arguments that the force free community kind of uses against it, this idea of uh, aversive control of behavior on a dog that's already stressed or is afraid or anxious or whatever. And that idea that you're just going to compound the underlying thing. Well, it doesn't always work that way. Like you've seen dogs where you've compelled them to do certain types of things and it's mildly stressful, um, but it actually helps them cope. And maybe some of that's at play there, the smaller doses of stress in and around that help reset the dog um, in some fashion. Right. And also I think there's a, a learning where the dog learns for the less reward motivated dogs, they learn to commit to the alternative behaviors and um, kind of tune out things that make them stressful in the same way that the dogs that we're talking about playing with in those environments mm -hmm. do, right? Like if I have a high enough play drive for my dog, I can put them in a stressful situation and they'll begin to commit to that play. And they still that whatever it is, the environment, a trigger over there could be bothersome to them, but it's like a form of permission to ignore it. And the dogs kind of put up blinders and over time you get a counter conditioning effect or, or whatever's happening there. And the dogs get better and better about those things until they can even become completely neutral and ignore something that was a trigger that's right next to them. Well, you see some of that same work happening with appropriate pressure around alternative behaviors as well. Like, Hey, I've taught this dog to do things. Now I'm compelling you to do these things in the presence of something that's making you uncomfortable. And maybe there's some of that happening there as well, where the dogs learn, okay, I can just put on blinders here. I can tune that out. It gives me something to focus my energies on. Maybe the little bits of stress reset their system to some degree. I don't know. It's interesting to think about, but it works both ways. You see people that are skilled with their pressure work and they resolve a lot of kind of reactivity issues in a, in a pretty undramatic way, but they're obviously applying those dose, small doses of stress to the dog on purpose. Uh, not usually to stop their reactions, but usually to compel them to do something in place of the reaction that would normally follow. Right. Yeah. Uh, compelling them to do an alternative that's incompatible with uh, the reactivity that we don't like the aggressive responses or flight responses or whatever. Yeah. Those are. Since Anya has her, her own levels of, um, reactivity and have all these ideas and <laughs> my neighborhood is perfectly set up for my training because now all this halloween decoration comes out right <laughs> and she hates it but they're they're very much predictable because i know what house has what <laughs> so these right. are one of my, <laughs> my training setups in terms of the distance and what i do and what is right before and how much does she react it's perfect in a way right. yeah. and then we have the, the uh, Christmas <laughs> decoration after. So, um, <laughs> That's coming into a rough season for Anya. <laughs> oh yeah, she's gonna hate it. <laughs> she's like, oh man. <laughs> so for the um, the whole fear aggression, anything that is rooted in fear, um, leash reactivity rooted in discomfort and fear is probably, you know, you talk about this a lot too, the number one symptom of today's dog ownership life. Um, and here also, I think there is a lot more where we can really lean into what it means to unlearn fear-based behavior, whether this is the aggression that has followed or avoidance behavior. And if you really think me coming from the neuroscience part, and then I think if you can add the, the actions to it, the practitioner uh, perspective, I think this is, a, to me, it's a very complicated topic. But it makes it very, very clear how, you know, understanding some nuances can really help you fine tune your protocols. Yes. So the goal really is, let's just say there's a dog, um, fear aggressive. You know, it's fear, there's no addiction, let's just say. Um, 
The goal is to weaken the neural connections there is between the triggers on the dogs, the stress response that is being initiated, and then the behavior that is followed by the stress response. And that is an active process of unlearning. So this never happens passively, meaning the dog never just passively forgets to be reactive. Mm -hmm. You actively have to help your dog or support your dog in working through this. And from the learning perspective of what has to happen with learning is two steps. You have to have enough repetitions without the reactivity, but also you have to open that loop and attach a new meaning to the situation, meaning that dog in the distance or the dog walking by in that neighborhood has to have a new meaning, yep. um, a positive meaning. Now, then for that to happen, for these new connections to happen in the brain, there are really three requirements that we have to have. We have to have some level of alertness, some mm -hmm. level of attention, and some level of motivation that translates into acetylcholine, adrenaline, dopamine, beautiful, magical <laughs> mix right. of neurotransmitters. <laughs> right. Now, motivation, let's start with that. Um, outside of maybe the leash reactivity or just in general, what does motivation in training mean for you? So for example, a dog just sits in front of you, you give a piece of food mm -hmm. that the motivation you're looking for what is motivation i used to say that you can't have too much motivation right that like that it was the the dog's desire for either some physical object whether it's food or a toy itself an object a tug a frisbee a ball or the, the ones that we typically use right um or an interaction right so a game played with the handler an interaction with the handler in some fashion um social interaction can be highly motivating to certain dogs but generally the, the levels for that are are lower and when you start talking about um stressful environments and complicated behaviors usually social interaction isn't enough motivation even though the dogs maybe really love having their ears scratched and love you petting on them and cooing at them and all that kind of stuff uh under stress that has a tendency to go away or if you ask the dog to do too much work to access that it's mm -hmm. it's way right um in that process so what it is for me is the dog's desire for either an object or an interaction and i would like levels that are significantly higher than the average person thinks you need like i like to say you need more motivation than you think you need right <laughs> the amount of motivation necessary to teach a dog to look at me or sit is one thing to ask the dog to do that in any environment or under stress or you know as soon as you have behavioral issues or you want very complex long behaviors that the dogs have to do under duress or under stress then we need more right and, and although there are dogs that have so much motivation you it, it can be difficult sometimes to get them to think clearly I, I think yesterday we talked a little bit about what i was curious about what's happening with a certain dog that can be very, very highly aroused and very, very goal oriented and still process information. And another one that almost gets blind and dumb and deaf when they go over the cliff of, of they want something so badly that all they can do is you know, throw themselves at, at you to get it. And they can't, they can't process their, the, that connection. And so we talk about taking arousal level down. So that that's what I think of when I think of motivation. And I think one of the key, problems we have is that people don't develop enough of it in isolation before they start to try to tackle problems whether it be a, just a teaching training problem or certainly anything like reactivity or a stress related problem and the place to develop that motivation is certainly is not in the environment where the dog's having the yeah. issue and people underdo that part of it yeah. um, you know that's part of the problem with the force free movement, right? A lot of behaviorists and things like that are coming up with these reward based protocols without any discussion of what it is to develop and channel and intensify motivation for these interactions away from those situations and how long that can take for certain dogs and the genetic components of that. Like there are going to be dogs that I like to say that the range of possible motivation a dog can express is governed by genetics and where they land in the range is governed by how what we do in that sense. But there's certainly a dog whose genetic levels of motivation are going to be significantly higher 
and there's going to be dogs where you're going to run up against the limits of those and sometimes quite quickly there's going to be a dog that's never going to be whether you starve them or whether you you spend do somersaults and cartwheels to get them to want to play or whatever that is they're never going to have a level of motivation that will override um either stressful experiences or that they're willing to work for and that's one of the things that that's hard to identify early on right yeah like we don't know what the genetic limits are and we don't know whether a dog's not expressing levels of useful motivation because um they haven't been given the opportunity they've been allowed to engage in other types of activities during development or somebody's really bad at it whatever it is and or is that the genetic limits of the dog right yeah i think for motivation you you absolutely right it's this that it doesn't happen on the walk when your dog is at the edge already and you're not going to change anything there and taking the time and also the, the owners right get taking allowing them the time to learn those skills because oftentimes it's a completely new interaction with their dog than what they have ever done before otherwise yeah. they might not be in that situation and i'm saying this with all like empathy right it's 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 oh, not yeah. easy why would you have to learn this if you're not in that situation with a puppy yeah but motivation um makes effort feel easy and you need a lot of effort that the dog has to put in to disengage from the trigger right. so if i have if i if there was a donut right here i would definitely enjoy the donut and easily <laughs> grab it but it, if getting a donut means i have to you know get dressed and get into the car and drive 10 minutes that's effort i would have to put in to get that donut and that's the motivation right that absolutely that's a good way of putting it absolutely yeah yeah do I am I motivated enough to go through all these hurdles to get my donut and that yeah. we want to foster and with mice right again here my study yeah 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 they do a lot with the, mice the, yeah. <laughs> the the mice that don't have dopamine and they still eat the cheese i it's really what a cliche but i guess mice really do eat like cheese right yes they do like cheese <laughs> they do like cheese um they still will eat and enjoy the cheese but you put the cheese one body length away from them they will not go for it that's again they don't want to put the effort into it effort feels too much and motivation dopamine makes that effort feel so much easier and that's right. what we really want right right uh, going through the hurdles with you and that making it feel easier that's exactly it yeah um okay so that's the motivation part then we have um uh, alertness so attention not no, alertness and attention different but alertness as an adrenaline mm -hmm. um, there has to be some adrenaline and here this yeah. is something that is also very you know there's a lot of funny protocols that i find um in terms of keeping the dog calm below threshold as still as possible so it's focus right we talked about this a little bit yesterday um adrenaline makes the body the organism active yep and it primes dogs in particular towards movement and I often compare this to like a, um, you're in the dog room and then adrenaline turns on the light so mm. it's active yep now in in terms of the the, the handling part of the dog um, is it potentially hurting the learning process to keep your dog trying to keep your dog as still as possible as calm as possible in terms of the learning and unlearning it or what is the you know, what is the helpful aspect of an arousal level for unlearning or rehabilitation of reactivity? Yeah, that's a super good point. And for sure, keeping a dog calm in difficult situations, that which is a common idea. Like, I don't want to add any arousal to it because my dog has arousal-based problems, right? There's this idea that, okay, my dog's reactive, and so any excitement is going to be oil on the fire to their reactivity right and to avoid that i have to keep them in a calm state right well one what i found is that's super hard to do with a lot of dogs right that then the way that people are trying to keep them calm is technically through suppression right because they're just physically unable to stay calm if the trigger is too close or if the environment is too difficult for them there's there, it's not going to happen and people mistake suppression for calmness which is a completely different state of mind yeah you're not moving because i'm forcing you to stay still yeah. but 
Uh, and you may not be reacting because my the pressure I put on you is overriding that behavior, but that doesn't your state of mind is not good in any way, shape, or form. And if those dogs can avoid or react, and sometimes their reactions are stronger than we want them to be, all that. So that can be a pipe dream for a certain dog. The other thing that I I think is you hit on it is adrenaline helps with the learning process, and a dog that's technically really calm doesn't notice details they're not motivated to do things in, in that sense and so unless that dog has a super high threshold and doesn't really care about those things then then that's not a functional way and it's really hard to have a dog do a stationary kind of calm behavior when they're stressed that's why when we say hey when you're redirecting your reactive dog always redirect into movement or an active behavior don't redirect them and to say here come here and sit and look at me like we don't ask them to do that we can ask an advanced dog that has huge amounts of desire to to do that but they've already learned to ignore the trigger and then they'll stare at you to activate something but that's a super high drive dog with a lot of teaching ahead of that pretty right. typically we're asking like hey you notice that thing there's a level of arousal that's coming let's do something with that arousal let's do something with that that energy and don't direct it at that thing let's direct it into this yeah like, move with me chase me play with me like whatever that activity is and so um like it's infinitely more effective to give the dog an active thing to do when they're stressed than it is to ask them to be calm right yeah. and and it's almost Im Im impossible for a certain type of dog and that's the only way actually also arousal is going to be necessary for them to want to access reinforcement right and it's kind of a, or a positive reinforcement anyway and so um in order for the dogs to to do that like i need some arousal right like otherwise they're not going to willingly perform those behaviors i could use negative reinforcement to force you into certain behaviors but if i'm going to use positive reinforcement then the dog has to be aroused to some degree and yeah. it's more like not saying you shouldn't be aroused it's saying what to do with a, your arousal now you're having these feelings these chemicals that make you want to move that make you want to react that make you want to do whatever it is here's what you do with that information that those feelings yeah let's heal face a ball do something else yeah with, with that energy right and i think you know that but you said it yourself it seems so logical to say okay i'm just gonna try everything I can to keep my dog calm so my dog doesn't react. But nature and biology just is not made for that. And it makes it also a little bit easier on handlers to know it's like you can keep moving, you know, you can do things with your dog if you learn these little skills and handling uh, tricks and tips here and there. I mean, there's more to yeah. it. Yeah. I think that also alleviates the, the handler's own anxiety because adrenaline certainly goes up in the handler too. Oh, and absolutely. Feeling to the side and, you know, stillness is just uh, counterproductive. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, I'm, I'm fa always fascinated with the amount of arousal and awareness that I, I mentioned it yesterday as well, that there's a dog with a certain level of awareness and edge or whatever you want to call it, a threshold that, that means this dog's going to be mildly anxious Yeah. or at least anxious enough to be aware of novel things in the environment and all that kind of stuff, right? And um, a lot of those dogs are really lovely to train if the if you have the right amount of that. And my hunch is, is that because there's a little bit of adrenaline, which improves focus and concentration and awareness, and they pick up on details, including the details we're trying to communicate to them, right? These are the dogs where I can make all these very subtle signaling in my breathing, and when I lift my eyebrow, I do all these other little things. And to for a very, very high threshold, very, very stable dog, which would be the kind of perfect companion dog, ultimately, a dog what they're looking for in a lot of service dog work, right? This dog that's just basically a blob, to lay around 99% of the time, occasionally get up and do something and then go back to laying around and isn't going to notice much of anything in the environment, just super steady furry doorstop kind of thing. But those dogs are not fun to try to get to do things. But the dogs that you really like to train, the dogs that learn quickly and take all that in, there is some degree of reactivity and awareness in those dogs. Uh, uh, that, and there's a sweet spot for 
what makes for a lovely dog to train. And if you have too much of it, of course, then they're constantly going over threshold and they can't function, but there's a, there's a nice spot. Yeah. Uh, and so that's an interesting thing as well. Just where's the point at which I get you excited, adrenalized, whatever you want to call it enough so that um, it actually improves the whole teaching learning process. Yeah. 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 I, I find like this whole combination of, of learning very, very interesting, especially at a level of, um, where you would call a dog be reactive, mm -hmm. but I'm actually like, from my perspective, like, okay, what is this dog noticing and why mm -hmm. that brings me to the focus aspect per se. So when, if adrenaline is turning on the light in the dog room, I say to Colin focus is putting a spotlight on something mm -hmm. and he is then the, the, the other thing that is often done in, you know, certain training setups, the dog sees, stares at the trigger <laughs> and might be seemingly calm or be suppressed still at least, but stares at the other dog. Mm -hmm. And then handlers, owners are being told to feed, 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 because we are now, it's below threshold. Mm -hmm. So what is the dog actually learning in that situation? Well, there's some mechanical things about those. So the, the feeding should come basically if you're presenting the dog with a trigger, if, you're, if we're working on reactivity, there's a, there's some different strategies for this, right? So there's a common reward based strategy where they want to allow the dog to look at the trigger, right? And as soon as the dog does something, um, some placating behavior, some turning, whether they soften their expression or they turn away from it or uh, they yawn or they do anything else, right? So they do some displacement type behavior, anything, then you reinforce that, right? You're like, hey, you noticed the trigger, you didn't react, you had some other behavior in place of that or some change in your demeanor and I'm gonna reinforce that. The problem with that is like if I'm, and there's another version that says, you know, mark or click the dog for looking at the trigger, you know, mm -hmm. it looks at the trigger, you click and we're trying to achieve counter conditioning. You look at that, I mark that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm reinforcing the dog for looking at that thing. And so the dog's going to want to look at it more. Right. And the reason that I typically try to avoid that doing that is you have to be very, very attentive to the dog's, um, uh, body language in that process, because the more I encourage a dog to look at the trigger, the more their behavior is going to be governed by how the trigger reacts, right? So if they're looking at it a lot and staring at it and it moves towards them or it does something suddenly, then it puts them over threshold and they react, right? And my goal is to keep them from reacting as much as possible. So what I have a tendency to, to encourage people to do is let the dog notice the trigger once you're, you're kind of aware of uh, how quickly they're going to react and how close you can be without them blowing up instantaneously. Let them notice it, redirect them or give them a cue that we've taught them away from that to turn away from that thing and then reinforce them for that. So what I'm looking for, instead of marking or rewarding them while they're looking at the thing, I want them to notice it, then turn away from it and then get reinforced. So I set up a training cycle in which that's likely to happen because I let them see it. And before they, they just notice it and I go this way, or I have a cue that I've built in and I practiced extensively away from those situations. Mm -hmm. the dog turns to me and I reinforce that. I move into, I almost always move into an active cycle. I don't just have them turn and hand them something. I turn and we do some stuff together and I make sure I'm moving and there's activity for them to do that. And then what'll happen is the dogs begin to look at something and immediately look at me, right? That's how I know when I don't have to prompt them. And that way I don't have to watch for them too, too closely because the more they're looking at it, there are some dogs they're looking and I have to judge whether they're looking as a relaxed kind of mouth hanging open, tongue out, like, oh, I'm looking at that thing, but, or is it turning into hard staring? Mm -hmm. They're talking with a really short fuse that if I let them look for a half second too long, they're blowing up and then you're behind them again. And so a lot of it for me is um, allowing an awareness and then immediately putting their energy into something else. Yeah. So it's this beautiful combination of 
the motivation to interact with you that you put in place before the adrenaline so there is some level of uh activation so that the dog you know can redirect and then the focus is on you not necessarily going too far and 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 yes um we do want the dogs eventually to recognize the triggers right but still Mm -hmm. the learning part at the beginning in the learning phase is focus on the handler so you have some control over what is being learned yep and what is being remembered yeah and you have a and you have a and you have a strong um alternative that you you can prompt the dog into so even if i don't through that methodology even if i don't ultimately cure the dog completely of their issues i tend to be able to really close the distance of the trigger meaning because the dog can be around a trigger and have an activity they can perform so i get a more functional response to that whether it be an environment or something else than uh so even if i don't fix it that my dog may say decide it's not going to be okay with any dog at any distance to them i have a much more functional response from them i go in that environment and they'll go okay i know there's dogs there but i'll pay attention to you and they begin to sort of trust that this activity is a safe activity for them and it, like we mentioned before it gives them permission to ignore the other stuff and they can be really functional they can walk right by another dog like i don't even know they're there like and that didn't necessarily mean some dogs are this is the path to curing them they because they decide that hey they don't have to worry about other dogs they get good they may even like other dogs or whatever the trigger is and and they're cured but for the dogs that aren't they're they're very functional Yes, you have to protect them from getting pushed too far, but they can be in and around things if they're not forced to directly interact with them or it's not too much intensity and they can just kind of ignore them. Uh, and, and so I think that's even if it doesn't ultimately work to change the dog's mind completely, it makes a much more easily handled, more functional dog that can work in, in the world more easily. Yeah. Yeah. And, and staying within that realm of of focus um again so mental focus focus ultimately determines what is being learned um and uh mental focus follows visual focus that's what we use to to see okay my dog is focusing on that visually and it means we can then assume that's you know whatever learning happens is kind of associated with what the dog is looking at and right. outside of leisure activity um you always talk about two very very um common problems or troubles that that owners run into that highlight the fact of what we think they learn and what they actually end up learning because of what they're focused on and it, it, that is overshadowing and mm. superstitious association yes can you can you explain what they mean yeah so overshadowing is uh also c- called blocking and i'm i, I maybe scientifically not using the terms exactly correctly um but uh, what we're talking about is anytime two signals or two stimuli are presented to a dog simultaneously the dog will pay more attention to the one that's more relevant to them and less attention to the other right and that more relevant one overshadows the dog's responsiveness to the other to the point where if there's enough of a discrepancy there they won't even notice the less relevant one right and we talk about it in obedience circumstances all the time right of course if i'm moving at the same time i'm giving a a verbal command the physical movement tends to be much more relevant to a dog so they're paying attention to that i think i'm getting them to pay attention to the word sit and really they're paying attention to my body language activity and it overshadows and blocks the dog's responsiveness to the cue that i was trying to get them to pay attention to right (laughs) so there's that kind of thing but it also can be uh in a lot of other stressful circumstances of my dog were technically focused on something in the environment and i gave them a signal they may not even notice that signal if that that stimulus that's happening simultaneously is way more relevant right and superstitious associations are um for uh, the way i use it and there's a, a, a there's a specific scientific uh, definition of su- the, where they use superstition se- differently than than I do, but I mean it's when the dog associates some uh, unpleasant experience or some stressful experience with something other than we were intending in our training, right? And so, um, if a dog were staring at something that was making him nervous, and I zinged him with an e collar, there is a chance that the dog associates that stressful experience with a thing that we're focused on. 
this doesn't happen as much as people like to think it does, but it is something you have to be kind of aware of that the dog can associate something in the environment that happened simultaneously or in conjunction with another experience. And now they, they see it, you see it a lot with location. Like somebody went into a certain, came into the training room for the first time and the dog's never been in here. And then the person cranked on the dog a whole bunch in that training session. And that dog had a stressful experience. The next time the dog approaches that room, the dog's showing you stress responses related to the room, right? And so my goal, this would ideally be my goal, but my goal would have been the reason the dog had a stressful experience was because the dog, I was trying to pressure the dog into doing something that I wanted them to do. They associated it with location instead. So instead of saying like, oh, that stress is because I didn't sit or I didn't down, they say, oh, this building means stress, or this room means stress, or that person means stress, or being on the left side means stress, right? See dogs avoiding heel position. Like sometimes that happens where people are cranking on their dog when the dog's next to them, and the dog says like, I don't know exactly what you want here. I can't figure out the parameters. So being next to you is an unsafe space. And I would call that a superstitious association as well, because it was different than what we attended. Yeah. So all kinds of stuff can happen in training dogs out in the, in, in the environment when there's activities happening around. And if we're doing things, the dog could associate that. We see this with distraction work as well. The big problem with distractions, if I'm applying novel distractions to a dog uh, during obedience and I correct them the first time because they behave incorrectly uh, around a, a distraction and they've never seen that distraction before, I have a higher likelihood of creating a superstitious association with that distraction. Right. And now my dog says, Ooh, I got to pay attention to those things. Those things are dangerous. Bad stuff happens. Whereas a familiar distraction doesn't provoke the same response. So if my dog has seen a certain type of distraction numerous times, and then I'm asking them to do obedience in the face of that distraction, and they don't, and I give them a correction, they're not associating that correction with that distraction because they have a history with that. But if they've never seen that, a clown comes up on a bicycle and they've never seen a clown on a bicycle before <laughs> and I correct them for not looking at me when I ask them to, they can become afraid of clowns on bicycles, right? <laughs> Wouldn't be, right? <laughs> me, yeah, I would too. <laughs> but anyway, I, that, that that's typically what I'm talking about. When I talk yeah, about. well, that, that's exactly the one of the things what, what the brain remembers and especially if something is novel, you know, the brain is like, pay attention. We've never seen this before. We need to figure out, is this good or bad for survival, reproduction? Yeah. And if it's then added something negative and it's like, well, definitely never can have that again. Yeah. I'd love your perspective on something that I've become really interested. In. I talked about it a little bit in Wisconsin and um, I won't think of it right now. The person that um, wrote the article that prompted my my resurgence and an interest in this is the fact that different parts of the dog's awareness and brain are involved with during the acquisition of new skills versus the performance of habitual behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, the way I think about it is when a dog's look, this is, could be the novel experience portion of it. When a dog's learning something new, they're very attentive to all the signals. They want something. And so if I reinforce, something when they're learning and reinforce sitting the dog says oh this this behavior appears to get me something i reinforce it again they're like yep sure enough this behavior definitely does right i didn't do it i don't get something hmm okay maybe i should do more and etc and they're factoring all that in they're taking in that information they're consciously trying to make connections between their behavior and outcomes like oop if i hear this noise and i move away then I don't get stepped on or whatever it is. Right. And they're learning about the world. There's a very conscious part of the brain. And then there's a point at which, and I don't know where it is specifically, but we know it happens where the dog's been doing something and now they're not so conscious. Like they're not actively thinking about outcomes as they do it, just like we aren't right. You're learning something new. You're very much focused on what you're doing and paying attention to whether it worked or didn't work. And then there's a point at which you do things that you've done and you're not, your brain's not even there anymore. Like you're somewhere else and you do the behavior potentially, but you're less cognizant of outcomes anymore. Right. And a different part of the brain becomes 
uh, active in that whole process. Mm -hmm. And so for me, neurochemically, I'd love to know what's happening during learning, early stages of learning. So here's a study if we could see in dogs' brains, like a brand new dog that's learned, we're doing initial training and what parts of their brain are active, what's happening neurochemically. And then, okay, here you have a dog that's trained, that's been doing these behaviors for some period of time. And now what's it look like neurochemically as they perform those, the same sets of behaviors, right? Yeah. Hunch is that it's different. And we know for a fact that reinforcement and punishment don't have the same effect on established behaviors that they have on behaviors in their infancy. Yeah. When a dog's learning something like, okay, this was good. I want to do more of it. This was bad. I'm not going to do that. And it has a very strong effect on whether or not they're likely to do it. But then behaviors that have been performed, I have the reactive dog that has walked around the neighborhood for three years, blowing up at other dogs every day for three years. That behavior is very resistant to punishment and very resistant to um, reinforcing alternative behaviors mm -hmm. in the same way because it's a different track to some degree. Yeah, I like I like that aspect of learning too because it's it's moving through. You know, you heard of these terms, there's working memory, the moment, you know, when people say my dog learns it in the moment, I do it 10 times. It's like the working memory, you kind of just retrieve what you just did in the moment. And then it goes into midterm memory. Yes. Um, and there, the main location we know is the hippocampus and everything is stored there. It's not really clear what midterm means, like how long is it? And I think that's also different for all dogs, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> how yes. long is the learning phase and how yeah. much time do I have to manipulate and introduce errors in the early learning, right? Until then through repetition, it becomes long-term and that's when it becomes habitual. Um, where that is habitually, the habitual memories, I'm actually not sure either, but um for 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 in terms of the 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 behavior when you say it's um resistant to punishment and to reinforcement um one thing that i have i don't want to say experimented with but what has worked anecdotally with dogs who have um for example rehearsed lunging at cars in a very specific environment a very specific spot over and over and over but the reactivity has been able to um, minimize in other areas so that it's indication of just it just happens so quickly the dog doesn't even think about it yeah um one way that needs to happen is you have to kind of bring it back into consciousness the behavior by the dog but you can't just tell the dog pay attention to your no. uh, to your behavior so what you kind of want to do is somehow try to even if it's kind of a closed loop right there's a trigger it's being retrieved, the memory, the behaviors, and then it closes and then it's done. And the dog has no control over it, and that's why it's so persistent to any kind of intervention. What you want to do is somehow open that loop and add a new element to it, yep. even if it's right after the behavior. And in this one anecdotal um, situation with that dog, the reactivity to the lunging was so quick, it still happened. So being proactive didn't really help. Um, but right after the dog was um, asked to do any kind of behavior that the dog knew really well, well enough to you know go into this even at higher arousal levels. And after a while, the dog gave the owner a few seconds of mm -hmm. yeah. more active thinking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They and delayed, then, they, yeah. you lengthened the fuse enough yeah. so that you could begin to be preemptive. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It does. Yeah. And and people are reluctant to do that, right? The idea that, okay, the dog's reacted. Now I can't go on and reinforce something else because I'm creating a loop, right? But it's it's frequently necessary for the dogs that have very short fuses. And you should see exactly what you're talking about, either a reduction in the intensity of your reaction or a slight, with dogs with a well-established, that may not be happening, but a slightly longer fuse that allows you then to install that behavior before they've reacted enough times to create a new loop where mm -hmm. the dog sees the trigger and instead of reacting, turns towards the alternative behavior. Yeah. Right? yeah. The other thing that's really interesting in all of this is that how for different dogs, that it doesn't take very many of a certain type of experience to make 
them uh, addicts of that experience to some degree, right? We talk about this a little bit. Like I use a lot of uh, kind of terminology that be like addiction-based terminology around around certain types of activities, especially mm -hmm. types of arousal-based activities, right? And I'm sure uh, we're manipulating this to our benefit to some degree with our play relationships and all that kind of stuff. I'm creating a little bit of a frisbee addict or whatever it's going to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I can do stuff with with that. But there are dogs that could, let's say, I could take this dog on a walk and the dog sees another dog and they react, right? And they do it a few times and then they gradually sort of go like, oh, like it's not something I need to react at. And they, without any kind of special intervention, they tried this behavior out and it just kind of goes away. They're like, oh, well, I, and they, they'll do it. Another dog does it like one time and or two times. And then they're like, oh yeah, I found, <laughs> I found my new hobby, right? This is it. This is the, that's such a great feeling. We see it with bite work all the time with young dog bite development, I should say. Like you have lots of dogs that have a kind of slow, steady progression. They learn to like these activities. I have a rag on a string and I wave it around and the dog chases it as they're younger and they bite it a little. And the more I practice it over a period of time, it gains intensity. And as the dog matures, it gets more and more intense and it turns into a, a quite a developed intense activity for that dog. You have some other dog that you do it once and they chase it, they get it the first time and then you go up there and you hold them up and they drop it and it runs and then they're it's like somebody flipped a light switch and they're bonkers. It's not like they did a slow, steady ramp up. They went from like casually interested to off a cliff. And I say, look, that dog turned on. We say, we say they turned on like right away. Like, and it was, it's clear and obvious. Their demeanor is not the same afterwards. They're like, you got a puppy and they're pulling at the end of the line and their teeth are chattering and they're like vibrating. They're like, oh man, what happened there? And so it's really fascinating when we start talking uh, about um, how quickly uh, a, a behavior can become really strongly reinforcing for one dog and not so much for another. Like leaving a dog behind a fence and letting them watch people walk by. Like with one dog, that first they show some interest and they woof a little bit. But if people are walking by all the time, they lose interest and they go lay in the shade and they ignore all the people walking by. And another dog is like, oh man. Like, that's insane. They bark the first time and they're like, ooh, that was fun. Another person comes, they bark and they, okay, the volume goes to 11 right away. Right? So yeah. It's, it's intense. Yeah. They're, they're probably, I mean, there are definitely genetic components to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's very clear. You see such difference in, in, in the breeds. But there's a difference between it feeling rewarding or then actually turning into an addiction. Right. And I think the genetic component is there. I don't know if it's probably more so that you kind of, um, prone yourself to that behavior to develop faster um, and then obviously all the experience that come together that determine whether or not you develop an addiction and what we do know is that for some dogs um, and here I'm, I'm I think that that well I don't want to say this is mostly in rescue dogs but dogs that have been neglected that don't live in very enriched life they will search they will seek an outlet and they mm -hmm. will are more likely to develop some sort of addictive addictive behavior towards that probably maladaptive behavior yep. versus others that despite all the enrichment <laughs> still yeah. have like their likings and kind of right. engage in that and i think you probably see it in rescue more frequently because those are the dogs that missed appropriate rearing systems and then became behavioral issues for people and wound up in rescue as a result of it right so the dog that wasn't having their energy channeled into the right sorts of activities that wasn't, you know, in a calculated way exposed and, and trained as a young dog. So they were seeking some place to put these impulses and energies and they discovered it on their own in some fashion. And it the, usually speaking, those dogs don't wind up in rescue uh, the first time they do it, but you know, the people went, oh, look at that. And then it escalated, it escalated, escalated. And now the dog's a behavior problem and off it goes, right? So yeah. it makes sense that you see lots of those in rescue. Yeah. In today's society, we often want to minimize, as you mentioned, as much stress as possible from our dogs. They should have a happy life and never have to face any stress. And then on top of it, 
Now there's more and more the discussion around, and especially when it comes to aversive tools, around asking the dog for consent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, as you have noticed, I like hard science. Psychology is, you know, by itself a wonderful discipline in general. Um, but I can wrap my head around how the dog could potentially give consent, given that that would mean the dog can conceptualize fully the environment, predict what is going to happen, construct emotions, and then communicate um, the consent. Yes. So what, what, what is your thought? And maybe more so even from, it doesn't come out of nowhere. And I understand the, the notion of wanting the dog to be okay, what you're doing, right. but when you say, okay, I'm looking for consent in my dog and my dog gave me consent. What is what are owners actually seeing, and how should we actually look at this whole consent topic? Yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's a kind of a problem for dog training. In, in a sense, when I talk a little bit about buy-in from my dog for training processes, what I'm trying to develop is a dog that, due to the experiences that I provided for them and the way I've channeled their energies, they they want to consent to the activities or the 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 handling or whatever things that i'm going to do to them um that they're they're going to want to do those things without me having to make them do it right at, at a point so i'm setting up ways in which they're going to appear to consent right but they but i i, I think it's um it's it's an inaccurate description of the way we conceive of consent in human beings like i i We've patterned them into um, appearing to consent to some degree. Like yeah. I've set the whole set of teaching things that taught them, hey, if you if if, if you do this, bad stuff's going to happen. You do this, good stuff's going to happen, and lots of and I of course set it up. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. You run up against the bad stuff less frequently than the good stuff, but it gives the guardrails to your behavior, like. That way is not going to work. This way works. This way works, 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 works. That doesn't work. This works, works, work. That doesn't work. Oh yeah, let's do this, right? And so those dogs then appear to consent in that sense. But I like, I have a really hard time thinking. I, I'm happy with the kind of cognitive revolution in dog training with the idea that we're obviously dogs have emotional states and we're beginning to recognize that their brains are probably more complex than we gave them credit for, but they're not human beings either. And that kind of projecting thought into the future and analyzing consequences that are more abstract to get, actually give informed consent to something. I don't think dogs are technically capable of that. And I think it's, it's a, taking anthropomorphism a little bit too far, right? A bit too far, yeah. <laughs> In my opinion. And if they technically could, then you're going to give those dogs freedom to do a lot of stuff with for a certain type of dog. There, there's going to be a freedom to do a lot of stuff that we don't want dogs doing. That's going to make a lot of uh, unproductive canine citizens that are going to be canine serial killers and stuff. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Forget about the threat of AI. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like <laughs> you'll have a, there will be a certain dog that like goes through life and doesn't cause very many problems as a result of being reared in that with those ideas. And there's going to be a whole bunch of dogs that are going to wind up being totally dysfunctional citizens. Right? Yeah. Like you yeah. can't, you can't give them that much freedom and that much choice in, in what's happening. Right? Yeah, I agree. I think what we think consent is, is more likely a result of some learning processes. Agreed. But, you know, understanding that gives handlers who really like, really want to have this teamwork, right? It gives them much more practical tools than saying, look for the consent. I'm like, well, I don't even yeah. know what that looks like. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and and we can leverage learning processes. And one of which is, for example, uh, classical conditioning, right? And yeah, uh, conditioned um, reward placement, you know, mm -hmm. this is how you often do this even in experiments where, you know, predictable cues become rewarding. And in a way the dog prefers being there or doing this or seeing that. Yeah. And that way kind of gives consent. Right. And, I know you 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 think a lot a lot about classical conditioning, 
um, because it is, you know, just the, the putting life into context, right? I think that is oh, uh, yeah. one-on-one uh, classical conditioning. And not just in training with clicker and yes, treat, yes, treat, um, but just life itself. So right. in what way classical conditioning, you know, what are maybe unexpected ways where we can maybe leverage classical conditioning to make life with our dogs easier? And what are examples where it totally works against us in the context of, you know, pet right. or having day-to-day -day life with your dog? Yeah, this is my, my area of current most interest, right? I went back and reread the Breland's article on the misbehavior of organisms, right? Mm -hmm. That that that's a, a fabulous yes. piece, of, piece of work. Every dog trainer should read that. Read the misbehavior <laughs> yes. of organisms. Right? Uh, so there was Breland's were Skinner's students that went off on their own, and they taught a lot of different animals to do uh, do tricks for as a business, and they encountered some of the difficulties. Uh, with classical conditioning uh, uh, as we went. So, but the way we leverage it ultimately to our advantage is things like patterning arousal level to location is a very classic example, right? My dog in the living room is a low arousal activity and I make sure that I don't, I don't, there's no um, highly um, reinforcing uh, arousing activities that ever take place there. So nothing exciting happens in the living room. This is a place for reflection and calmness. And so I set the dog up. So none of those things ever happen there. I don't play with the dog in the house, et cetera, et cetera. And then I go to like a location, like a training field or something, an agility field with my dog. And then these types of activities take place there. And there's a conditioned arousal that comes, my dog sees a piece of agility equipment, gets excited, so then it's going to run faster and it functions. And so we use these things all the time where we're patterning uh, location or some other physical cue or verbal cues. I tell the dog what types of activities we're going to do. So I can tell them we're about to do a really exciting activity. I can tell them we're going to do a different, nothing's going to happen activity. And through classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning, those dogs eventually kind of accept that. And they're in the right kind of state of mind to perform the behaviors I want them to perform in those locations. And then conversely, we run up against lots of, lots of difficulties right with that we see it all the time in control related things if i took my dog to the park all the time and played ball is the classic example i give right then my dog's going to be aroused at the park right? mm -hmm. when i go to the park my dog's going to be excited i went to the park every day and played ball with you for three months right? and so i go to the park one day and then i say oh, i want to do a down stay with my dog right that's going to be harder for my dog to manage right <laughs> in those in those circumstances so classical conditioning can then create problems. We see lots of little things like I'm using rewards in obedience. I, my dog sits and I give and I throw a ball for my dog. My dog sits and I throw a ball for my dog. And I do that repeatedly, right? So I'm a high reinforcer for, for a opera behavior of sitting, right? And so now my dog's starting to sit, but he's not sitting all the way. Like he sits with his butt hovering two inches off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because he's anticipating reinforcement and he's tensing up his muscles in anticipation of chasing a ball. That's a Pavlovian contingency, right? And so that excitement, that muscle tension is involuntary on the dog's part. And so he can't sit and have his thighs muscles flexed in anticipation of launching and so now i get a slow sit or a hover sit and then i'm trying to make them sit and it doesn't function because that that conditioned response is involuntary and there's billions of these little things where yeah. we, we do so many things repetitively in dog training that we've created all kinds of classical condition classical conditioned states that sometimes are uh in concert with what we want and they aid it and other times they cause us problems right a a as we go and so just kind of being aware of them some of it's out of our control like meaning some of these connections are going to happen whether we want them to or not and just how best to deal with that right so for instance the sitting example what we start doing when we see that as a problem we have to break some of that contingency and then we install lots of other things between the behavior and the reinforcement so 
bridging behaviors, deferred rewards, right? Where we release the dog and then a reward comes five seconds later instead of right after, right? All these other things that we do to kind of insulate the behavior from the consequences of anticipatory behavior, which is classically Pavlovian, right? Yeah. Any kind of dog says, every time I throw the dumbbell, you're going to send me. So now I'm throwing the dumbbell. My dog's doing this. He's standing up on his toenails and scooting forward, right? That tension in his body is involuntary. Like it's not, a, it's not a choice. He's not being disobedient right there. There's a Pavlovian connection that's causing problems with my dog's stability when he wait, has to wait to go get the dumbbell <laughs> or whatever that is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> causing problems with the stability. Yeah. yeah. I think that's another good example why, you know, the whole dog ownership life, whatever you do with your dog is so much more than just this linear reward and punishment, reward oh, yeah. and punishment. That in Kruger effect, right? It's like, oh man, I know nothing. <laughs> I know nothing. It's totally true. <laughs> true. So if you had the magic wand and you could change something in order to you know whatever the progression looks like whatever the, the uh, a better life for dogs look like what would be one of the things that you would like to change i think the biggest thing would be that that people did some research and some stuff ahead of the process and that they were really honest with themselves about what their conception of having a dog was like not living in some fantasy of what it is, but actually like, what's your, re what's the reality of your life, the time commitment you have to give to a dog, um, how much, how deep you want to dig into this. And then what kind of dog is going to be suitable for your lifestyle, right? Uh, so, uh, some forethought would solve lots of the problems. It's so much of it is impulsive. It's the wrong, I mentioned it yesterday, but the, it's the, the wrong dog in the wrong environment, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and if the wrong dog's in the wrong environment, the uh, the pressures on the owner to learn things that they didn't, they don't want to learn, is high, very high. Right? Yes, this dog could be functional in this environment, but it's this because you got the wrong one. It's going to require that you become a dog trainer now. <laughs> yeah. But not just a dog owner, right? Yeah. And so for me, the the intervention should be happening ahead of that. I always say that there should be some classes on on dogs as a part of our public education. Like yeah. in, in elementary school like and yeah. junior high school, right? Kind of thing. It should be f over half the households in the country have dogs in them, right? You cannot go through life without encountering dogs. You can't go to public parks. You can't go like they are woven deeply into our fabric of our lives. And yeah. people don't understand lots about them. Yeah. Like some of the basic stuff if that was impressed upon children in some fashion as they grew up, maybe they would make better choices before they decided to incorporate a dog into their life. Like, if, because I think most people just have no idea. They have a, a recollection of a dog they had when they were a kid that was no trouble, or they have some romantic notion of what dogs are and what dog training are and what certain breeds are based on TV film, like who knows what goes mm -hmm. these, these things. And then they get into it and, if it's way, some people rise to the occasion. Like I know a lot of dog trainers that are dog trainers because they got it. They had the wrong dog. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if they had the wrong dog. They, that was, uh, that was a problem. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, and they had to learn and they were the kind of person that says like, I got to rise to this occasion. And so they, they did, they went and learned all the stuff and they were, and then they said, Oh, this is kind of fun and kind of fascinating. And they went down that path, but it would dogs lives would be improved radically if we intervened way earlier in that process yeah.